Thank you all for joining the AISS Americas for this uh, global book launch of J Dr. James Doyle's book, a Delphi book on renewing America's nuclear arsenal, options for the 21st century. I say it's the global launch because most of the time that we launch uh, AISS Adelphi books, we do it in London at our headquarters. But uh, we're doing the first one here in uh, Washington, and I'm not sure if we have money to take you all around the world for additional launches, but uh, we're going to be recording this event so anybody else can, uh, can see it uh, uh, on our website afterwards. So modernizing the U.S. full triad of air, land, and sea-based nuclear weapons will cost $400 million, according to the Congressional Research Service. Some other experts estimate that it'll cost more, much more, some of them. So questions are raised about whether this is all affordable. Other questions are raised uh, concerning whether it's all needed. In his new book, James Doyle demonstrates viable alternatives to the modernization plan that he argues would maintain deterrence at a lower cost. He also contends that alternatives offer advantages over the existing plan with regard to maintaining strategic stability with Russia and China, and upholding existing arms control treaties, as well as supporting the global nonproliferation regime. Ultimately, Jim provides options for ensuring the US nuclear force structure is better suited to the strategic environment of the 21st century. But before we hear him explain all of that, let me tell you just a little bit about Jim. Dr. Doyle holds, holds a PhD in International Security Studies from the University of Virginia. For 17 years, he worked as a political scientist at Los Alamos National Laboratory, specializing in nuclear nonproliferation, where I first met him. And many of you know the, uh, the story, the sad story, of his departure from Los Alamos in 2014. In 2015, Jim was awarded the first Paul Olam Fellowship from the Plowshares Fund. He was also a non-resident fellow at the Belfer Center at Harvard University. His recent work focuses on nuclear forces modernization, innovation in the field of nuclear threats, and planning for the elimination of nuclear weapons. This Adelphi book isn't Jim's first publication with our institute. He contributed two very important articles to our survival series. The most recent one last year was in some ways a preview of his book, Better Ways to Modernize the US Nuclear Arsenal. And his first one in 2013, the cover story, The Case for Abolition, had something to do with his change of career path. Our full event will run for an hour with audience uh, Q&A and discussion after Jim's presentation. At the end, uh, and we'll end uh, promptly after an hour, you're all uh, welcome to purchase uh, a copy of Jim's book, and he'll probably be willing to sign it for no additional charge, uh, and it's only going to cost $15 to begin with. So this event is being recorded, it's on the record, and it'll be posted on the IIWS website after the event. Uh, tweeting is encouraged. If I see any of you playing with your iPhones, I'm going to charitably assume that you're tweeting his remarks and not reading somebody else's. So, uh, Jim, tell us about your uh, thesis and turn on your microphone. Well, thank you very much, Mark. I will uh, deliver my mar remarks from up here so I can move around a little bit. I like to roam the room a bit. I will, uh, I want to begin by thanking the Institute and also the Plowshares Fund, they provided some of the money that I used while I was doing the research for this um, book that it took place during 2015 and 2016. Nick Redman and Alice Iveson at uh, IISS London were very helpful in actually getting the book into print. I'm also honored to be an Adelphi author. It's a very prestigious series of monographs and books. Um, it's a long-standing um, resource on the issues of nuclear security and nonproliferation and nuclear strategy. I urge everyone to look into them, especially those that were written 30 or 40 years ago when the basic outlines of the theories of nuclear deterrence and how the uh, 
stability between the United States and the Soviet Union was maintained. I still find those old additions extremely valuable. And there's never been a time more important in my life than to review these, these uh, issues. Um, I'm a particularly thankful to all of you who work on these issues on a day-to-day -day basis, trying to make sure that nuclear weapons are never used again. I'll begin by going over my approach to the book and its main points, but then I'd like to get off script as soon as possible so that we can have a, a discussion. There's no doubt that US forces need to be modernized. But if you look at the official body of documents and statements, uh, both historical and the most recent um, documents that describe what nuclear weapons are actually for, what role they play in our national security strategy, it's very clear that alternatives to the current modernization plan are viable. I present three of these options in order to illustrate a range of choice, but they're by no means the, the only options that are available. Uh, one could mix and match um, many of the different delivery systems in terms of the numbers of ICBMs or the number of strategic ballistic, ballistic missile submarines and so forth. It's not really the numbers that matter. It's whether they meet the criteria that have been described for what nuclear forces are set to achieve in our, new, in our international security strategy. I purposely did not assess plans that are more expansive or expensive than the current plan. Um, although it is possible, because we have a new nuclear posture review that's underway right now, and it's supposed to be concluded by the end of the year, that official guidance could say uh, it could it change some of the uh, rationale for our forces. It could say that we need more forces. But I purposely looked at um, three alternatives that were both less expensive and less extensive than the plan to modernize all the legs of the triad. It'll become clearer during the discussion that I, I think that it would not be in the national security interests of the United States to say, for example, we need to build 18 or 20 new ballistic missile submarines, or that we needed 600 deployed ballistic missiles rather than 400. In fact, two of my options that I look at have the elimination of the land-based nuclear force altogether. So just to go back over some of the documents that I used to uh, select my evaluation, evaluation criteria for three options. The 2010 Nuclear Posture Review, 2011 Department of Defense Document on Sustaining U.S. Global Leadership, 2013 Report on Nuclear Employment Strategy, and the 2014 Quadrennial Defense Review, and 2015 National Security Strategy of the United States. And even these are just a sample of the documents that I used in the research. I, I paid particular attention to congressional testimony by government officials and especially statements made by Department of Defense leadership and the commanders of US nuclear forces. So what, do, what is the purpose of nuclear weapons in US strategy? I put together four evaluation criteria that also are sort of combinations of, of at least two each. The first is do the forces provide adequate deterrence across a range of possible threats to the United States? And it's uh, accepted wisdom that in order to provide deterrence, the force has to provide a full range of options from the use of two or three nuclear weapons to full-scale attacks on the forces of a um, country such as Russia that has hundreds of nuclear weapons or thousands of nuclear weapons. Uh, and lots of um, capabilities in terms of the destructive power of each of the warheads used. So that was one of the criteria. All the options that I look at had to meet that criteria. The second one is, does the force support strategic stability? This is the idea that uh, on a sort of day-to-day -day operating basis, you um, want to have forces that are postured to reduce the possibility of war by miscalculation or accident. And you also want to have forces that don't contribute to a negative spiral 
of relationships with other nuclear armed states. The third set of criteria is nuclear security, and by that term, I mean the security from terrorism, theft, or misuse of the nuclear weapons themselves, the warheads that are carried by them, or the directly weapons usable nuclear materials. The bigger footprint that you have for your strategic forces with those items in terms of where they're spread around the world, how often they are moved and transported, you can have a higher risk that they'd be exposed to the possible uh, terrorist attack. So it's, uh, do forces contribute to the nuclear security um, problem, reduce the nuclear security problem, and also do they contribute to our non-proliferation policy? Long-standing uh, effort of the United States to reduce the number of countries around the world that acquire nuclear weapons. And I would say that the proliferation, non-proliferation there is both horizontal and vertical. So we, we don't want other countries to acquire nuclear weapons, and we also want those that possess them not to expand their arsenals dramatically, or even at all. The, the third, I mean, the fourth and final set of criteria have to do with the contribution that nuclear forces make to our conventional military operations and the trade-offs between spending finite defense resources, budget resources, on nuclear versus conventional arms. So I wanted the options to represent a balanced approach to that problem. Excuse me. So let's just go through a couple of the main points, general points about all the options, and then we can talk in more detail about each one. So it's clear that you can have reasonable alternatives of modernized nuclear forces that meet the uh, limits under the New START Treaty between Russia and the United States that uh, require both to have no more than 1,550 strategically deployed nuclear warheads, accountable nu nuclear warheads. And um, they are forces that are sufficient to deter uh, all the range of plausible threats to the United States. And these can be purchased, for example, much at a cost much less, almost half the cost in terms of third option for uh, the building of these forces over the next 30 years. And I think it's uh, appropriate to say something about estimated costs at this point. These are all soft numbers. For example, if the Navy is asked to uh, provide an estimate for the Columbia class nuclear submarine to replace the Ohio class, their uh, confidence in their estimates are usually around 43 to 45%. So they know that there's a greater than 50% chance that their estimates are going to be wrong. If you look at major procurement programs over a 25 or 30 year history, then uh, I think that the figure is about 27% are, uh, they're estimated to be, they're underestimated um, by 27% on average, and sometimes major weapons programs will cost 70% greater than, than we thought. The first lead uh, hull of the Ohio class submarine, for example, cost almost 70% more than it was estimated. Um, the B-2 bomber is another example. So these figures for cost, uh, while I tried to use both government sources and those that are respected in terms of projecting, the cost of these items, they, they're, all, they're all pretty soft. But I think that we can speak in general terms when we talk about major savings for a, a, a procurement of, uh, like for one major leg of the triad, for example. If you eliminated the land-based leg, then there's going to be significant savings, not only in the acquisition of 600 new missiles, but in the operating and life cycle costs over the course of the 30 or 40 years that they'll be in service. The other thing is that um, some of the alternatives that I'm going to present have advantages for main maintaining strategic stability vis-a-vis -vis Russia and China. Also for upholding existing arms control treaties, not undercutting New START or the, Internet, uh, the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, or the NPT or the Comprehensive Debt nuclear test ban. I think that the current modernization option to replace the entire triad 
uh, has contains elements that um, are present challenges to the maintenance of those treaties. The options can also endow the U.S. with nuclear force better suited to the strategic environment of the 21st century and mark an advance uh, on the existing collection of means to deli deliver nuclear weapons in terms of supporting conventional military options. I'd also like to point out that we really don't have a triad. We really have five ways to deliver nuclear weapons, and I'm indebted to uh, my colleague John Wolfstall for pointing this out in a, in a recent discussion that I saw at CSIS. We can deliver nuclear weapons by uh, strategic submarines through submarine submarine launched ballistic missiles, intercontinental ballistic missiles, land based here in the in the United States. Also by strategic aircraft, two different ways: uh, gravity bombs or in, uh, that can be guided or unguided, and uh, air launched cruise missiles. And the fifth way we can deliver nuclear weapons is with tactical uh, aircraft. Um, with our weapons based in the NATO, with our NATO allies. So even the term triad is a little bit of a misnomer. Okay, let's look at the options that I, that I considered. And we have um, a chart here on, up on the screen that helps go over that. And it's a little, a little bit difficult to read. So what I'll describe is the current plan and um, any... Let me just say there's, there's copies too outside if anybody wants to oh, okay. there's pass there. out some that are left over. Terrific. So as many of you are probably familiar, the current plan to uh, replace the entire tri triad calls for 100 new B-21 Raider strategic bombers, 1,000 what they're calling the Long Range Strategic Option, or LRSO, which would be a next generation nuclear armed cruise missile. 400 Minuteman three replacements will actually purchase more than 600 missile, missiles to have 400 deployed. 12 new Columbia class submarines with 16 missile tubes each. Uh, probably about 200 to 300 B61 12 guided nuclear bombs. Those are designed to be, uh, some of them to be deployed in NATO and another uh, number of them reserved back in the United States. That would lead to a, a start accountable arsenal within the start limits, which is 1,550. But in reality, that would probably be a deployed force of closer to 2,000 weapons. Because under the START Treaty, aircraft are counted as one uh, weapon each when they can carry many more nuclear weapons. Option one, which I call the streamlined triad, also procures 1,000 uh, new strategic bombers and 1,000, uh, 100 strategic bombers and 1,000 new cruise missiles. But it would have only 300 deployed Minuteman three or Minuteman three replacement, which is called the ground-based strategic deterrent, instead of 400. Eight new submarines with 16 missile tubes each instead of 12. And we would go ahead and produce the B61 uh, bomb, guided um, gravity bomb, but and deploy it with NATO, just as in option one. This also can result in a, a force with 1,100 to 1,500 weapons. Option two begins to introduce some significant changes. The, the biggest one is, well, instead of 100 aircraft, we buy 80. But here, if you look at the uh, land-based, what's traditionally called the land-based leg of the triad, will slowly phase out the Minuteman ICBM force by 2030 and not replace it. In the, in the category of nuclear ballistic submarines, you have 10 Columbia class instead of 12. In the category of non-strategic nuclear weapons, the B61 Mod 12 bomb would be produced but not deployed to NATO forces. There again, the nuclear weapons that are currently deployed in the five NATO nations would be withdrawn at some time period, 2025 to 2030. This results in a slightly lower force uh, in terms of deployed nuclear weapons. Option three, which I call the dispersed maritime dyad, 
also procures 80 new strategic bombers, but without the, oh, and I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that the option two also does not procure the 1,000 new nuclear armed cruise missiles. And also option three uh, has an innovative uh, proposal in the category of nuclear submarines. Here I would suggest building six Columbia class dedicated strategic ballistic missile submarines with the 16 tubes each, but then procure an additional eight Virginia class submarines, which carry four ballistic missiles each. That submarine would be a dual purpose uh, conventional and nuclear platform with the capabilities for land attack, anti-ship missiles, and so on, similar to the way the Virginia class attack submarines are armed today. The B-61-12 would be produced again, but not deployed in Europe. And you have a smaller force there. So let's talk briefly about the pros and cons of each of the options, and then we can get into discussion. In terms of the streamlined and triad, this would provide a small savings over the uh, course of a 30-year um, reconstruction of US nuclear forces. My estimate is that you would save $272 billion over, over 30 years. This option would be somewhat more supportive of the uh, Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty because the United States could uh, rightfully argue that it had reduced its submarine uh, force and its land-based intercontinental ballistic missile force. On the negative side, I think that this proposed force structure still undermines uh, strategic stability vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Russia in particular. And this is because the United States is fielding not only, pre preparing to field not only new, new nuclear weapons, but conventional systems that have strategic potential. This is the so-called ballist, I mean, the, the ballistic missile defense programs and prompt global strike the fact that you are planning to deploy 1,000 new nuclear-armed cruise missiles at the same time you're procuring up to 3,000 conventionally armed long-range nuclear cruise missiles that have a variety of capabilities as well. The B-61-12, the advanced uh, replacement for our current tactical bombs will be the first guided nuclear weapon with extreme accuracy so that it's able to attack hardened uh, targets uh, with very low yield, which some are concerned means that it would be more usable in the mind of commanders. So these attributes of that um, force, as in the current modernization plan and the streamlined triad, I think contain elements that risk Russia concluding that it's the United States' objective to achieve strategic primacy and undermine the deterrence so that we have greater freedom of action around the world in, in terms of um, using military force, uh, in terms of um, influencing allies, and in terms of um, sort of coercing uh, Russia when it comes to contests in terms of interests and in, in around the globe. And that is... Uh, contrary to the sort of fundamental aspect of nuclear deterrence, where you must be concerned about security perceptions of your adversary so that both sides don't think they're about to be attacked and in the midst of a crisis think that they must employ their forces before they lose their forces. In other words, one of the primary objectives of structuring nuclear forces is that they don't create um, tension or panic in the mind of your adversary during times of strategic tension. Um, these, uh, the streamlined option offers few opportunities for improving nuclear security because it retains the uh, land-based nuclear missiles deployed in the upper Midwest. These are the most vulnerable to cyber attack and perhaps even direct attack. These uh, silos are are surrounded by chain link fences. They're isolated from one another. There's been controversy over the response time of security forces if somebody tried to break in to a silo. And they're also vulnerable 
uh, perhaps the most vulnerable leg of the forces to cyber attack. You also have with this option the continued deployment of US nuclear bombs in Europe to bases like in countries such as Turkey and Belgium where there's a rising incident, uh, incidence of terror attacks. In terms of supporting arms control, the current uh, option and the um, streamlined triad both contain one particular element which I think threatens the comprehensive test ban treaty. And that's a proposal to, uh, in addition to building um, new delivery vehicles, the, several of the warheads in the arsenal are going to be upgraded. And one plan in particular, which is called the Inter Interoperable Warhead Program, where they're trying to design uh, warheads that for the first time can be carried by both sub submarine launched ballistic missiles and intercontinental ballistic missiles. This plan requires uh, the merging of components that have not been physically test explosively tested before. And so if you get 15 or 20 years down the road into this program and uh, confidence decreases in the reliability of this new warhead design, it could uh, increase pressure to return to explosive testing, which was, of course, undermine the comprehensive nuclear test ban treaty. It offers, the first option offers um, a weak relief from the proje projected defense budget shortfalls. And also, it doesn't make any novel contributions to conventional operations and capabilities. If we move to the option number two, air sea dyad, the absence of the replacement for the Minuteman, what's being called the ground based strategic deterrent, the absence of the B 61 12 deployment to Europe, and cancellation of the long range standoff weapon, the new cruise missile. I think contribute to an improving arms race and crisis stability. They would also give the United States more credit in terms of fulfilling its obligations under Article 6 of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. And I think that this is something that could be finessed in terms of the relationship with Russia. I think it'd be important to sort of continue to proceed to develop some of these programs but indicate that they're on the negotiating table. And then we could uh, just introduce discussions with Russia about whether or not it is willing to curtail some of its activities that are undermining the non the, its violation of the Inter-Range Nuclear Forces Treaty and to explore the possibility of a new round of strategic arms reductions beyond New START. Uh, we would offer this option has a greater savings over the 30 year period. I estimate it at $432 billion. This eliminates most of the required trade offs between nuclear and conventional procurements. In terms of negatives, there's no guarantee of Russian reciprocity for US restraint. Um, and if this were to go on over a period of 15 or 20 years, some would say that the perception of strategic asymmetry where the United States does not no longer has a land-based uh, intercontinental ballistic um, leg of the triad creates a perception of weakness vis-a-vis -vis Russia. I think that the time period involved uh, allows us to approach this question with, with Russia and China and say, okay, what, what if? What if we were willing to um, allow the Minuteman to retire after 2030. Let's begin these discussions. Would this influence your procurement plans? For example, both China and Russia are planning to uh, acquire a new heavy warhead, uh, ICBM that can carry up to 10 warheads. We could begin discussions now saying, look, if we're gonna phase out our ICBMs over beginning in 2030, how does that influence your plans to acquire these missiles? Do you still see the need for them? In terms of cons, uh, an, an, another um, uncertainty is that the, the B-61-12 bomb deployed with our NATO forces, any major change to our nuclear posture requires building a consensus among our European allies. 
And that is by no means a done deal. I mean, just if the United States, it does carry the greatest weight within NATO, but um, they're particularly the East European NATO members, uh, at least now with Russia's current posture, would object to the removal of the weapons. So that's another um, diplomatic challenge. It's another challenge that would have to be illuminated as we discussed uh, the possibility of these things with Russia. Um, I think that's, oh good, I I'm, I'm apologize. So we get into the third option, which I call the dispersed maritime dyad. The innovation, the major innovation here is to uh, put ballistic missiles on a Virginia class submarines. We know how much the Virginia class costs. We've already procured, uh, I think, um, nine or 10 of the submarines. They're being built remarkably uh, on time and within budget. They cost about half as much as a Columbia class submarine. They're being equipped with a larger, what they call the Virginia payload module, which could uh, accommodate an, a, a modified submarine launched ballistic missile. You would then have a larger number of our most invulnerable uh, delivery vehicles um, deployed on patrol. Uh, it, the patrol rates would almost uh, approach those during the 1980s. If you had a combination of 14 submarines, you could retain patrol levels in the Pacific and the Atlantic at, at higher rates. This also has the advantage of um, if submarines become more vulnerable to technology, sensor technology, and attack technology in the future, you have a larger number of platforms and more dispersed. You also have the capabilities of the, on the Virginia class conventional attack that can, can contribute to conventional operations and it would um, accommodate for the loss of the four Ohio class submarines that were all converted to conventional only cruise missile car carriers. If we proceed with the Columbia plan as it is and the current number of acquisition of the Virginia class, then there's going to be a gap for about 15 years where that, that conventional land attack capability um, is gone and uh, won't be re um, replaced unless you purchase more uh, Virginia class submarines as this option recommends. Again, if you look at the um, possible negatives of this, the same uh, problem of Russian reciprocity, uh, the same um, need to convince the NATO allies that you can withdraw the B-61 and provide extended deterrence from the United States. There is some technical uncertainty in terms of uh, designing a new submarine-launched ballistic missile um, that could fit in the Virginia payload model uh, module. And all these alternatives, um, like I said before, the cost estimates for all of them are, are, are quite uncertain. But um, those are the three basic options. The other thing that I wanted to add at to discuss at the end here is that we're talking about very long time horizons here for the completion of this modernization, 30 years. And so we can't anticipate how technologies are going to change. We can't anticipate how much more vulnerable uh, our forces could become, um, especially to cyber attack. Uh, to the possibility of monitoring, greater monitoring the oceans and so forth. So we have to think, uh, I think, more creatively. It's, it's surprising to me that we're planning on building the same force structure that we had during the Cold War when we look out um, 30 years into the future. I also think that we underestimate the robustness of, of deterrence. I think that the the force structure of 15, 1,550 warheads, if you, if you fluctuate between 100 above that or 200 or 300 below that, it doesn't have that great of an in, uh, impact on deterrence. Deterrence has proved itself to be 
remarkably stable through a number of historical crises and so forth. So why not use the flexibility of that knowledge of the robustness of deterrence and experiment with how some of these um, options might be able to contribute to improving strategic stability and even uh, improving the strategic relationship between the United States and its major nuclear competitors. And so I'd like to end there and okay. open it for discussion. Thanks very much, Jim. You know, I just, uh, as you were you know, going through some of these numbers, I realized that what I said at the beginning, I, I should have uh, uh, clarified when I said $400 billion estimate by the Congressional Research Service, that was only over a 10-year <coughs> period. And, I, and I, when you were talking about reductions, I assume you're, you're kind of using that $1 trillion yes. uh, figure that has yeah. been uh, done by some uh, private sector and, uh, and estimates. In fact, the most recent estimates would be about $1.3 trillion for the current modernization so is, plan. Is, is that, is that, is, when you say the savings, is that what you're measuring it against? Or? Yes. Okay, okay. Uh, let's engage in some discussion here. Uh, I'll call you. You'll say your name, even if I've already said it. And, uh, and then you'll make a concise, uh, witty question. You'll, you don't have to be witty. Uh, Harlan, please. Are we getting a mic? You're getting a mic. Let's see if it works. Okay, it's coming. Wait. It uh, seems like that mic is not working. Is there another mic? Um, why, I, I, go ahead and ask I, your question, and I will repeat it for the purposes of recording. I hope my question is witty, but it certainly is cynical. Uh, you're dealing with theology. Uh, back in the early 60s, Bob McNamara arbitrarily chose 400 equivalent megatons for assured disturbance, which was nonsense. It was based on actually no sort of anal analysis. Basically, we've been doing this to say equal with the Russians. So my first question, serious question, Bob, what does it take to deter Russia? Okay, hang on a second. Repeat the question now. With this, the mic is working. Uh, I'm Harlan Ullman. Hello. You know, go through the rest of it. Okay, go ahead. Uh, I'm Harlan Ullman with a number of uh, places here in Washington. Uh, my question is really derived from, first of all, is the concept of the 20th century concept of deterrence relevant today? When you deal with Russia, China, North Korea, and you admit Britain and France, we hope it will keep probably their nuclear deterrent, but if Corbyn comes to power in Britain, that is a question. But what does it take to deter Russia and deter from what? Uh, we're going to build probably the current plan because we're going to feel insecure that we have to keep up with the Russians. But when you take a look at Russia, China, for example, of North Korea, what are your views about what it really takes to deter them and deter them from what? It seems to me we could have almost infinite nuclear weapons and Mr. Putin would still be meddling in our elections. OK, thank you. That's an excellent question. And you're correct in uh, describing nuclear deterrence as a field of theology, almost. What the official documents say is that US nuclear forces must possess attributes and capabilities that convince any potential enemy that the adverse consequences of attacking the United States or its allies and partners far outweigh any potential benefit they may seek to gain through an attack. It doesn't qualify whether this is a nuclear attack or a conventional attack, whatever. That's the first observation I would say about that characterization. The second one is that this is not a testable objective. How do we know? We can never know what set of forces and capabilities will convince any potential enemy about the negative consequences of their actions, but we, because we can't know the thought process that goes on in their calculations during a crisis. This description of deterrence leaves open the possibility of being a deterrence maximalist or a deterrence minimalist. A maximalist would say, well, since we don't know, we have to scare the hell out of them. We have to have capabilities that could uh, very rapidly uh, destroy every potential target that's of value to that, that regime. We have to have multiple ways of doing it. Uh, we have to, um, this will give us the greatest amount of leverage. This will give us the greatest amount of security. Well, as I said before, the nuclear age, you have to be concerned about your adversary's sense of security. If you threaten nuclear primacy, you also risk the fact that they would act um, more desperately in a crisis and you could engage in nuclear war by miscalculation. I think a much better formulation for deterrence is one 
that um, has been termed second strike stability in the literature in the past. And that is you only need a, uh, a capability of forces that can absorb an attack by your potential adversary and deliver a devastating response. This, I think, is probably what McNamara had in mind. And to do that, you don't need 1,550 deliverable nuclear weapons. Perhaps you need only 150 deliverable nuclear weapons. There have been uh, studies by um, many reputable people, uh, including General Cartwright, former uh, commander of STRATCOM, uh, Air Force, uh, former Air Force officers who said, well, maybe we only need 300 weapons. Um, so there's a great deal of debate about that. Right now, I think the, the trend in the dialogue is toward a more muscular um, nuclear capability. Uh, and that is a direct consequence of the fact that we have rather um, tense relationships with Russia uh, in particular and, and with China as well. So I think it's an excellent question. I think it's a question that all American taxpayers ought to be concerned with. What does deter? And are we buying too much? And are we using finite defense resources for the wrong security problems? So um, actually, let me go to Laura Kennedy, and then I'll go in the back here. So in the front row, please. OK, Laura Kennedy. I just oh, hang on. Just let the, the oh, microphone come. We're recording this. Thank you, Laura Kennedy. Um, I have two questions, one political, one practical. Let me start with the practical one. Is that I already tweeted um, to please Mark um, a brief, very brief summation of your, you know, the fact that you're offering three different um, choices. And I immediately got a tweet back um, saying, is there a written piece um, on this? So is there something that will be online that uh, we can tweet for your eager audience? We're going we're gonna to put the video online, so that, that's the best answer. OK, great. Political, and that is um, in terms of, of um, options two and three that would get rid of the ICBMs. Uh, is there anyone in Congress beyond, say, maybe one or two? Or do you have a sense that anyone is seriously looking at at, at, at this option. And that's, that's, that's not to imply that, that, that uh, I, I don't think they should be. I'm just asking uh, because we seem so wedded to this. So I'm just, what's your sense of um, uh, the climate out there for well, some of these? Well, that option changes? has one, one uh, very serious champion, and that is former Secretary, Secretary of Defense William Perry. Um, and many others uh, have said this option should be seriously considered for a number of reasons, including some of the ones that I mentioned. But if you look at politics, you have congressional politics, what you have is a, I think, a strategic missile caucus, which are uh, made up of representatives and senators from the states where the missiles are deployed, and they are protecting budgets and base jobs and so forth. You also have very powerful lobbies in terms of the aerospace companies that will build the next generation of intercontinental ballistic missiles. So I think the political landscape is extremely challenging to um, you know, sway or convince uh, that to look at this. But th those are secondary considerations. I mean, we're talking about the role that these weapons play in the security of the United States, and, and that should be paramount in our discussion. So I'm just going to follow up on this with uh, sort of a little bit, you know, similar kind of question, but from the opposite side. Uh, you mentioned, uh, you know, the uh, rising tensions with Russia, also with China. Uh, you could add uh, North Korea to this. Uh, the the forces of the world seem to be moving in the direction opposite uh, uh, to what uh, you are advocating. Uh, you've got uh, uh, the president of the United States, who apparently said maybe we should have ten times as many weapons as exist today. So this. Uh, the nuclear forces re review underway, you, you um, acknowledge that it might even um, come up with a suggestion to, uh, to build up rather than down. Do you feel um, that you're becoming more of a you know, whistling in the wind here, given this uh, the correlation of forces moving in a different direction? Oh, I've been doing that for most of my career. <laughs> 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 there are good reasons to consider reductions, even this time of heightened uh, tensions. First and foremost is, let's look at the threats that we face every single day. They are 
primarily not the threat of a bolt of the blue exchange of nuclear forces with Russia or China. They are um, unconventional warfare. They are terrorists, uh, terror attacks. They are cybersecurity, um, mass migrations. Uh, certainly, you have uh, rogue states or, or aggressive states, let's say North Korea and so on. But if you look at what the military priorities that we have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, they don't, they're not nuclear forces. Why not take advantage of the fact that if you adopt the view that second strike stability is all you need, then let's um, build an efficient nuclear force that provides that capability and let's make sure that we can devote um, resources to, to other defense priorities. Um, the second thing is this notion of anticipatory arms control that I mentioned. Because I believe that uh, second strike stability is robust and can be achieved without too much of an outlay of uh, resources, why not have the strategic dialogue with um, our potential adversaries? These are long-term procurement programs. They are also facing re resource constraints in their countries as well. So uh, I know that this is something that the United States government has been working on uh, year after year. And uh, currently, the Russians don't want to sit down at the table. But that's no reason to discontinue those efforts. So that's another reason why we should consider um, reductions. Um, the third uh, issue. Uh, has to do with our role in the leadership of the international nonproliferation regime. We're obligated uh, under the NPT to seek the eventual elimination of nuclear weapons. And um, currently, I think you're all familiar with the, uh, pro the treaty to, to prohibit nuclear weapons has, a, um, has, been, has succeeded beyond people's expectations. And there's actually a treaty now. I think well, somebody probably has the number, but I think it's over 120 nations have joined. Unfortunately, none of the nations that possess nuclear weapons have joined. But I, I think that we have to keep um, showing a willingness to, as we are obligated to under the, our treaties, to reduce, and, uh, reduce the size of our nuclear forces and depend less and less in, on them in our national security strategy. Okay. Thank you, Jim. Let's take a couple questions. Um, I'm going to take a couple right in the back, who, uh, in the fifth row, and then, yes, then, next, then the, the lady here is also, I think, in the fifth row. So. Blue shirt and black blood. Hi, Alex Sanchez, I'm a defense analyst. Um, around a few years ago, maybe like three or four, there was an article, there are a few articles in, about the morale of the Air Force personnel that have to deal, that have to be you know, in Wyoming, in South Dakota, in Idaho, guarding these ICBMs, and they have to spend like 24 hour shifts locked in a bunker, and how demoralized they felt. I was wondering if in your research you have discussed uh, have you, you have like researched this issue and if morale has improved and you know if you go towards like you know having more nuclear weapons not more icbms do you mean that you're going to need like more you know, groups of, of air force personnel underground for 24-hour shifts and how is the air force reacting to this possibility thank you can, 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 can you hold that until we get one more question sure. can you deal with uh, sharon squasoni next thank you jim secretary of defense uh jim mattis told congress and 2015, that he had some questions about the land leg, the the land leg of the triad. Now, is he bowing to the inevitability of um, having to support all three, or what? What do you make of his comments since then? Is there any hope there? Thanks. Yeah, those are, those two questions have some relationship. Thank you for both of them. In terms of the first question, I did. Yeah, there were several years there where the, the performance of the intercontinental ballistic missile crews and in their leadership was in question. Uh, you had senior leadership uh, dismissed because of bad behavior in Russia. There were members of the crews that were involved in um, drug rings and uh, other types of, of local crime. Um, and I think that part of that is because the mission 
is very difficult. Doesn't seem to make sense. You're you're waiting around in the silos either either to unleash a strategic nuclear weapon that will kill hundreds of thousands of people, or you're waiting to be attacked. Um, these are fixed points. Everybody knows where they are. Uh, they're vulnerable. In terms of the Air Force efforts to improve morale, I think that they probably extended uh, leave time a little bit better. They certainly considered higher salaries and, and stepped up training programs. There were several high-level, high uh, both internal and external investigations about this with suggestions. I think most of the suggestions were, let's tell them how important the mission is, let's, that everybody's relying on them and, and give them better benefits and pay. I don't see that that addresses the fundamental questions of whether the, the ICBM is a weapon that we should continue to have in our arsenal for the next 30, 40, 50, 70 years. And that leads to um, Sharon's question. Uh, yeah, there was this brief hint that the Secretary of Defense might consider not replacing the Minuteman 3 Force when it retires in 2030. That was, you know, made me optimistic. It would be wonderful if that was really discussed now in terms of the nuclear posture review that's going forward. I haven't heard anything other than um, a sort of reaffirmation of the, the value role of the uh, ballistic missile force. And when they talk about that value, there's, there's two characteristics, I suppose. One is that any country attempting to attack the United States with the objective of trying to degrade our ability to retaliate would have to destroy the 400 uh, Minuteman silos out in the, in the center of the country, and that would require a great attacking force. So number one, it's very difficult to destroy them all because they're called the Minuteman, and the minute we see that they're under attack, our plans are to launch a bunch of them. Number two, is you'd have to say, you'd be coming right out front and saying, this is a crisis that we thought was worth risking Armageddon over. So the, the, those are the, the value, uh, the supposed value. I say, well, you know, why not try to eliminate the, to the absolute minimum the number of nuclear aim points in the continental United States? If you don't need them for deterrence, then... Um, I think that uh, why risk having the bullseye in the heartland of America where you would not only have hundreds of nuclear detonations there, but fall out going north to Canada and to the cities of the northeastern United States. Um, that's just a liability. If you don't need them, then, then I think that the resources that could be saved as well can contribute to other missions. I think that probably Mattis was concerned with the fiscal um, challenges of rebuilding the triad. And this is the thing that's going to be keeping this issue uh, in debate. It really does not appear, unless you have increased projected um, national GDP growth and uh, top line, major top line increases to the defense budget, whether you'll be able to rebuild the triad without serious cuts to other conventional weapons priorities. Thanks, Jim. I think we have room for two more questions. Um, and we're not, we got five people wanted to talk. Um, Don Daniel in the third row, he's, he's asked yours. Right okay, Chris Kessler um, in the fourth row here. And then uh, is it Sam Brown in, in the second row? Thank you, uh, Chris Kessler. 40 years ago, when I was at the other end of my career and other things, I worked at the Center for Naval Analyses and in a little group. And at that time, there was a particular technical question where at the unclassified level, there was speculation that um, SSBNs might be vulnerable. At the classified level, it was, oh no, that's a no concern whatsoever. We've got it covered. At the top secret something or other, the answer was essentially, oh. And I know the number of steps were taken on that particular issue for a while, but it goes back to your question about technology vulnerabilities. And uh, so my question is really, 
reliance on fewer methods, fewer deliveries methods, and your, your confidence in the stability that you seek in that context. Hold that question, and we'll get Sion Browns for the last uh, question here. Second row, get, get the microphone. What is missing from your chart is an option four, and perhaps it's implied. And that would be that over the 30-year period that the bulk of the $1.3 trillion outlay for modernization uh, be devoted to modernization of our overall force posture, conventional and unconventional capabilities okay, that would severely downplay the reliance on nuclear weapons. Now, maybe this is only theology, but the idea would be for the United States to develop a sufficient deterrent capability, even of nuclear ta attack, that could put important values at risk in an adversary, or uh, a second strike capability that was not primarily dependent upon nuclear weapons. Now, maybe this is all implied and taken for granted, but I would suggest that we are at the cusp of a major international debate with respect to that issue. Thank you. So two technology-related questions to end on. The first one, I think if you have a uh, second strike, secure second strike concept of strategic deterrence, then our forces are vastly oversized. And all you have to do is have confidence that you have some type of nuclear delivery vehicles that can survive an attempted first strike and deliver devastating retaliation to those aspects of your, of your adversary nation's um, what they value in terms. And it doesn't take many nuclear weapons to do that. Like I said before, 150 deliverable nuclear weapons. Uh, if you have strategic aircraft that uh, maybe they're based at four primary bases, but they can operate out of 25 bases, similar to what we have now. You have submarines that are invulnerable uh, and always at sea and on patrol at one point. Only two, one or two boats required for that. Then, um, you, your, your concerns about uh, vulnerability are, are decreased. Now, is there the possibility of technological surprise? There always is. But the, uh, the Soviet Union and Russia existed, um, I think, up until the present day with the knowledge that the US Navy has 24-hour target information about, on every Soviet missile-carrying boat. So, uh, and we still haven't been tempted to conduct a first strike against Russia. Uh, those are my comments about that. I mean, in terms of the other question, I would like to take one-tenth of one percent of the savings for, for either any of the options here and put it into an investment in our diplomatic infrastructure. The reason we're in the mess today in terms of considering either rebuilding the entire nuclear triad or, heaven forbid, we have a nuclear posture review that says we even need more than that. There, were, there was an article yesterday, which I guess has been um, refuted, that there was consideration of putting strategic bombers back out on runways on alert 24-7. Well, if we um, took one-tenth of one percent and rebuilt our diplomatic infrastructure, and our diplomatic credibility around the world and focused on trying to improve relationships with Russia and China, then you potentially could return to a period uh, during the mid-1990s up to the year 2000 when we were discussing with Russia unprecedented ways of uh, providing transparency with one another's nuclear forces and coordinating those forces to be kept in an absolute minimum. Um, here again, it sounds like I'm whistling past the, the graveyard, but you know, why do you see the knee-jerk reaction to these old um, canons of, of the Cold War that this, will, this is the best way to protect, protect ourselves by potentially building more and more different ways to deliver nuclear weapons and not attempting to revitalize uh, 
our diplomatic efforts and other elements of national power that can contribute to improving relations with our potential adversaries. Thank you very much, Jim. Um, we are not going to send uh, copies of your book to those poor missileers in the silos to tell them that their ICBMs could be um, eliminated without any loss to deterrence and further reduce their morale. But uh, we are selling them outside uh, to all of you before you leave for only $15. Jim will sign them afterwards. But before you buy them, please join me in thanking uh, Jim. <laughs>